Old School Lane Casual Chat is brought to you by the members of OldSchoolLane.blogspot.com and is associated with ManicExpression.com, the website where you can truly express yourself. to episode 21 of Casual Chats. As usual, I am Patricia, and today we have ourselves another special guest. Today's special guest is, once again, an author writing an upcoming book. The upcoming book tells us of the -the behind-the-scenes stories of one of the most beloved Christmas movies of all time, A Christmas Story. And joining us right now is none other than book author Cassine Gaines. Cassine, welcome aboard to Casual Chats. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here, be to be back. <laughs> yes, I know. Um, surprisingly, you were actually the first person that we've ever interviewed for Old School Lane, so it's nice to have you back for a, uh, for a podcast. Well, <laughs> so um, tell us, what have you been doing since we last talked to you when you were writing on the book Inside Pee-wee's Playhouse, uh, the untold... Un- uh, what was, yeah, un, the untold, unauthorized, and unpredictable story of a pop culture phenomenon. Yeah, well, since, so since then, uh, I've been really busy working on uh, my new book, which was just released, called A Christmas Story, Behind the Scenes of a Holiday Classic. One of the great things with writing these pop culture books is that I'm such a big fan of these pop culture properties, and uh, as the author, I get to go back and interview people that I've seen on television a bunch of times or people that had written or directed uh, movies and TV shows that I'm a big fan of. And A Christmas Story was no different. I spoke with uh, the majority of the film's cast, some of the film's crew, and uh, it was really great to be able to chronicle their stories. It's one of those things where um, the DVD special features are extensive on A Christmas Story. Um, However, There were still lots of stories that hadn't been told, and I was excited about being able to bring those stories out in the book. That sounds great. Now, it's interesting that out of all the movies that came out, A Christmas Story has been dubbed as probably not only one of the best Christmas movies of all time, but for a lot of people, it's number one. I mean, so much so that TBS actually does a marathon 24 hours a day on Christmas Eve every single year. Yeah. No, and, and that is, you know, the Christmas Story Marathon is must-see TV. You know, it's funny, if you look at the ratings, as many people that tune into the Super Bowl tune into A Christmas Story at some point in time during the 24-hour marathon. And it's really interesting when you think about the fact that the movie really doesn't have any big stars. The movie is a modest movie uh, made on a modest budget, but it has gone on to really uh, touch a lot of people and resonate with a lot of people because it is so true and so genuine and all of the vignettes are so funny and it's so relatable i mean every single person uh can relate to wanting something that they can't have whether it be a christmas gift or um a person they're in love with or a job or something like that you know everyone has that experience of really really wanting something and trying uh to jump through hoops to get it and that's one of the things that that touches people about a christmas story Yes, uh, that is very interesting. Now, out of all the Christmas movies, it could have been like A Christmas Carol, like the one million adaptations of it. It could have been It's a Wonderful Life. It could have been, you know, a whole bunch of all those other movies that we've come to know. Why A Christmas Story? Well, I think because um, because it is so universal. You know, uh, A Christmas Story really is set in the Midwest. Um, it's set in the 1930s, 1940s. But 
I was not around then. <laughs> I never lived in the Midwest, but something about that movie rings so true to me in a way that I think, um, you know, a lot of Christmas movies sometimes feel kind of cheesy or a little bit corny, um, but A Christmas Story, I don't think feels like that at all. It feels really true. I mean, the Parker family that um, that the movie is based around is really a real family. You know, the dad curses and, you know, is, is sometimes ineffectionate towards the mom and the mom is a little bit daft, but she looks out for the kids and, um, you know, tries her best to navigate with the husband and, um, you know, having a little brother who is just nutty and doesn't want to eat his food and sticks his face in his plate and you know, you have to kind of carry him around almost like he's a prop. You know, he's not even really a person. I mean, there's there's something that's so true um, about that movie, including kind of the creepy Santa Claus, <laughs> you know, the, the original bad Santa. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot that I think people can relate to. And for me, writing a book, I have to write a book on something that I love and something that I can spend a lot of time with um, because writing a book is often – very lonely work um so i do love a christmas story and because of that i felt like yeah i could commit to working closely with this film and this material uh for two years so um you know it really it really was no competition with the other christmas movies i love a lot of christmas movies but a christmas story certainly has a special place in my heart as does a lot of other people to tell you the truth now, A Christmas Story is based off of the autobiography of Gene Shepard. What differences or similarities does the book have with the movie? Yeah, well, one of the things, too, just to, just to clarify, is that A Christmas Story is actually based on a number of short stories that Gene Shepard uh, would tell. Um, he would use a fictional character of uh, Ralphie Parker um, to kind of stand in for him, and the stories were autobiographical but it wasn't actually an autobiography. So the book wasn't a, um, you know, this is what happened in my life, you know, from beginning to end, but they were kind of stories and vignettes that had come out of his childhood. And there's a lot of debate about how exaggerated um, those stories are. And some people say that those stories are uh, just very barely true to Gene Shepard's life. And some people say that they are actually quite autobiographical. Um, we do know that Gene Shepard had a brother named Randy. Um, he, you know, the parent characters are very similar to um, his real life parents. He did really have a friend named Flick. He really did have a teacher named Miss Shields. He really did go to Warren G. Harding Elementary School in home in Indiana. But um, but the the greater details um, are are a little bit debated. But to to get back to your question, uh, um, the Things that are the most different are um, some of the stories in their original short story form were not actually set around Christmas time. Um, the vignette where uh, the Bumpus Hounds come in and steal the turkey was not actually a Christmas turkey. It was an Easter turkey. So some of the stories were uh, really repurposed to work for the film. Um, Gene Shepard wrote about a lot of periods of his childhood, not just Christmas time. So a lot of the stories come out of different moments in his childhood um, and when he was different years old and uh, ended up going into a Christmas story to kind of fit that narrative. Wow, that's quite fascinating. Now, in talks of uh, the movie, it's interesting that this movie came out in 1983 during a time in which a lot of movies, uh, particular genres, were like all the rage. You know, you had like the coming of age movies with John Hughes, like Pretty in Pink, Sixteen Candles, The Breakfast Club. You had the fantasy movies like Never Ending Story and um, The Princess Bride. And you had, um, you know, the sci-fi movies, you know, kind of like Back to the Future and the Star Wars movies and the Star Trek movies. And, you know, something like a Christmas story is something that you do not relate to when you think of 80s movies. You think of, you know, action movies like Rambo. You think of um, Terminator. You, um, so I'm just, you know, when it, whenever somebody discusses about it, it just feels like something that came out like many years prior. And it just, you know, to say the least, it I think it resonates with a lot of people because even though it did come out in the four, um, in the 80s, which was supposed to be 
based off the 1940s, it does have things about it that make it relevant today. Like, as you mentioned before, the relatable characters and the relatable situations and how we perceive what Christmas is about and um, just uh, wanting a gift or the creepy Santa and the and the bully and the um, the friends that he had and, you know, the imaginations. Everything about it is just screaming childhood. And I think that regardless of what m year the movie came out or what genre of movies that were popular at the time, there's just something about A Christmas Story that has really resonated into many people's hearts. No, I agree with you completely. And in fact, you know, that's actually something that uh, Bob Clark, who was the director of A Christmas Story, really found that he was up against. He also directed Porky's, and you know, Porky's is more in line with the type of movies that was that were coming out at the time, as you kind of you know intimated. Um, but when he went to studios and said, you know, I want to do a film based on the works of Gene Shepard, a lot of people said, well. You would never, you know, that's not going to make money. No, no one wants to see that. No one's interested in that. And Bob Clark was really insistent. It wasn't until Porky's was such a big success that he had the capital to go to MGM and say, you know, this is what I want to do as my next film. And they said, you know, here's $6 million. Go ahead. Um, so, yeah, it really was a very big risk. And a lot of people, a lot of critics, I should say, um, didn't think that A Christmas Story was going to be successful. And initially, it wasn't very successful. Um, Roger Ebert actually uh, has kind of a, a famous quote, or at least it's famous in my eyes, um, and I open up the book with it, talking about how um, A Christmas Story is a type of film that either no one will see or everyone will see. Um, it either will not resonate with anyone or it will resonate with everyone. And um, obviously Roger Ebert was completely right because um, there isn't a person that I know that dislikes that movie. Um, it really you know, is something that a lot of people look forward to and uh, can recite <laughs> lines from and, and quote um, and you know, get, still get excited when they see a leg lamp you know, in a bar or something like that. So, um, so that's really an exciting thing. Um, and, and one of the things that I think you are dead on about when you talk about A Christmas Story being different for movies at the time. Yeah, it's like the equivalent of releasing uh, a documentary in this time of day when everybody is into superhero movies. Yeah. Or yeah, if you no, were to... You're, you're yeah, or if you were to release a cinematic platformer in a time of first-person shooters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, it's funny because I... And sometimes those are the things that, um, that resonate, you know, because they're different. Um, you know, the, the important thing to keep sight of here is that a Christmas story is really about the story. You know, there are no, well, I shouldn't say no, there are very few special effects. Um, there's, you know, it's not a big flashy movie. Like I said, there are no Hollywood stars. You know, there were people that uh, had been in films before and, you know, recognizable faces certainly, but there are, you know, no, you know, Jack Nicholson was not, you know, playing the dad, um, even though he was considered for the part of the dad, actually, believe it or not. Really? Uh, uh, yeah, Jack Nicholson was actually, he was, um, he, he was uh, considered for the part of the dad and he was interested in playing it, but MGM uh, didn't want to pay Jack Nicholson the amount of money that he would have, uh, he would have wanted to, to be paid. And could you imagine, because I can't, I, can you imagine a Christmas story with Jack Nicholson as the dad? I can't even imagine what that would be like. Yeah, especially with his, it's like that, you know, that Jack Nicholson movie where he was, um, not that Jack, um, do you, do you know that movie, that horror movie that Jack Nicholson was in? And, you know, it the was, Shining yeah, no, 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 not The Shining, that, the, the other one, um, which was supposed to be like one of his first roles, uh, I think it was like some sort of B-horror movie, and oh, he, is it, uh, not Little Shop of Horrors, no, 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 not that one, uh, I forget what it is, I think it had something, to, I think maybe, uh, um, I think it was one of, um, Boris Karloff's last roles, and he just basically stuck up like a sore thumb because it was supposed to take place in Transylvania, and here comes, you know, Jack Nicholson, he's from California, and he had like that sort of <laughs> accent, you know. 
So, yeah, uh, I can't imagine, you know, because if it's supposed to be taking place in the 40s and it's set in Indiana, I doubt that Jack Nicholson would be able to pull it off with his accent and the way he was able to portray himself as, like, some sort of serious character at the time. But Have you ever seen Jack Nicholson in uh, the Tommy film? The Tommy the, the film. Adaptation, the adaptation of uh, The Who's Tommy that was done for, um, for film. I have heard of it. I've never seen it. You, you should see it because Jack Nicholson stands out like a, a sore thumb there, too. I actually, a lot of people hate that movie. I actually love that movie, and there are lots of movies that I love that people hate. But, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I, do love, I do love the, the, the Tommy movie, and it is, um, but Jack Nicholson is particularly um, miscast. Awkward. Yeah, miscast. Definitely miscast. It's a, such a small part, but it makes you go, why in God's name did they cast Jack Nicholson in this tiny part? Even though it's a tiny part, it's really it's really a, a horrible casting job. <laughs> yeah, so I think that, um, you know, it's interesting that the casting of A Christmas Story, it, it did have people that we kind of knew, but at the same time, there weren't like A-list uh, celebrities, but... Yeah, it was interesting, the casting choice of all the people who were to be in this movies. And from what I understand, a lot of these people don't even go into acting anymore afterwards, right? Yeah, you're, you're right about that. Um, you know, the, the biggest success story out of A Christmas Story was, or rather is, Peter Billingsley. And Peter Billingsley played Ralphie. Um, so it's fitting that he has gone on to the most success, perhaps. But Peter Billingsley uh, now is a pretty prominent person in Hollywood. He um, was one of the producers on the first Iron Man movie. He is director on Couples Retreat and The Breakup. He, uh, I'm trying to remember if he directed or produced Elf. I should probably know that off the top of my head, but he um, was was creatively involved in Elf for sure. And he also has a small part in that movie. Um, so there's a lot of um, really important credits um, to to his credit. Um, but yeah, the other the other guys, the other Christmas Story kids, even though they're now all adults, um, uh, continue to uh, work. Um, not all of them are still in the business. Zach Ward, who played Scott Farkas, the bully, um, is an actor who still turns up in a ton of places. And uh, Zach Ward um, was also in Transformers. He was in... Uh, Titus, he was in uh, a bunch of things, Freddy vs. Jason, um, so he does a lot of work, actually, and he's currently, actually, I should probably plug this for him, he is um, currently raising funds on Indiegogo for a great anti-bullying campaign um, that he's using his role as uh, Scott Farkas, a bully, in A Christmas Story to help bring awareness to stop uh stop bullying in schools and he has a um a program that he's working with a bunch of high schools on and there's a way that you can donate um and and that's just fascinating i, I love that he's doing that i think that that's a, 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 such a great thing wow that's really fascinating a person who played a bully in the movie is doing an anti-bully campaign yeah and, and i and i think it's great because you know one of the things that i, I think at least I'll speak personally. You know, I I loved watching the bad guy in movies. You know, I, I think there's just something fun about it. I just saw The Wizard of Oz um, in 3D. You know, it's playing now this week. And um, you, how, you know, you just, you love the Wicked Witch. You know, you just love watching the bad guys. You know, when you watch Home Alone, uh, another Christmas movie that I love, you know, the, the bad guys are great. You know, you, you root for Macaulay Culkin's character, but you you know, have so much fun with the bad guys. And, um, and I love that, um, that character, Scud Farkas in a Christmas story is such a, uh, popular and well-known character. And I love that he's using his platform as playing that character in a film to say, you know, yeah, maybe it's fun to watch bullies on screen, but bullying in schools is really a problem. And, uh, and it doesn't feel good to be bullied. And, um, you know, if he can use his celebrity uh, to help bring awareness to that, then uh, I think it's great that he's doing it. Yeah, I think so, too. I definitely think so. Uh, what is your favorite scene in the movie? I should have known that you would ask me that. I didn't even I didn't even plan for that question. <laughs> so, 
So my, uh, that, that's, such a, that's such a predictable question, and I, I'm not even prepared for it. You stumped me. Um, there are so many scenes that I love, but I have to say, one of my favorite things I love about the movie is, uh, it's such a small moment, but when, um, after Flick gets his tongue stuck to the flagpole, and um, it, they, you know, you see the next shot is the shot of the inside the classroom, and Miss Shields is trying to get um, the boys to fess up to putting, you know, to getting Flick to put his tongue to the flagpole, and she's trying to guilt Ralphie into giving himself up, and you know, those who are at fault know their blame, and you know, she's trying so hard, and and he looks around like, who, who, who is she talking to? Um, it's just, it's one of those moments that I think. Um, I really, <laughs> that really resonates with me. You know, you can remember um, being in school and maybe done, you know, having done something wrong and the teacher trying to get someone to confess. And, you know, if you're really uh, a good person, you'll you'll tell the truth. No one will get in trouble. And, you know, you know better. <laughs> you, know, you know better than to raise your hand and say, it was me. I did the bad thing. Um, so I think it's uh, a funny moment that always kind of sticks out for me. That's a great scene indeed. I mean, there are tons of other moments, but, um, you know, that's kind of the fun thing, you know, I've had, um, you know, I have this Facebook page for the book that I maintain, which is, um, at facebook.com slash a Christmas story book. And, um, you know, almost every day I'm, I post a picture or, um, you know, reference a scene from the movie. And it's amazing to me that I've been doing this almost every day since April and, there are still scenes to reference. I mean, you know, there, there are so many little funny lines and funny moments. Um, you know, just uh, yesterday, I think it was, I posted um, when the old man is working on his crossword puzzle and he says, you know, what's the name of the Lone Ranger's cousin's horse? And, you know, and again, it's just such a funny, tiny little line in the movie, but it, uh, it uh, stands out and people remember it and everyone's commenting, Victor, Victor, the answer is Victor. And, um, you know, again, just a, a piece of trivia that we all know from this Christmas movie that uh, we'll never need in our lives. We'll never need to know who, what the name of the Lone Ranger's cousin's horse is, but we all know it thanks to this movie. Yeah, especially with the new reboot of Lone Ranger. Yeah, which um, which is uh, curious. I have a co-worker of mine and a friend of mine that uh, that loves the new Lone Ranger. I have not seen it. I've heard the reviews, of course. I, you know, I, I hear that it's not very good, but who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'd love it. Like I said, I, I do love lots of movies that people dislike. So, Yeah, I also have a friend of mine uh, who loves westerns, and he said that The Lone Ranger was a really great example of the classic B-Western movies. And there's another friend who saw this movie, and he couldn't stand it in the slightest. He said everything about it was just absolutely awful. So I... Yeah, I haven't seen it yet, so maybe, you know, I'll take into consideration on what I'm going for. I think this is for people who love that genre in a time in which that genre is pretty much dead. You know, we had Django Unchained, which was last year, and it wasn't supposed to be like a B-Western. It was supposed to be a, an homage to Spaghetti Westerns, but yeah, um, I doubt that we're going to be having any more tributes to B-Westerns anytime soon. <laughs> I mean, you know, I uh, I'm one of these people that thinks that Quentin Tarantino can do no wrong. You know, I I um I I pretty much love everything that he does. So I I was totally on board for Django Unchained. I, I thought it was a wild ride. I loved it. But um, but yeah. So I I agree with you though. I think that you know some of these things come in and out of fashion. Um, Jerry Bruckheimer, who was behind the Lone Ranger and also the uh, Pirates films for Disney, um, recently I think has severed his relationship with Disney, perhaps because of the Lone Ranger, Ranger not doing too well. Um, so yeah, you're probably right. I think there probably is. Uh, we're we're not likely to see a Lone Ranger sequel, at least. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think but so. But the movie made a ton of money overseas, actually. Yeah, it did. It did make a ton of movie uh, money overseas, but I think because the amount of money that was put into advertisement, plus the huge amount of hate that it got, I don't think we'll be able to see it. It's like the equivalent of the Green Lantern movie, in which it had a ton of advertisement, and it made over $400 million, but people just hated that movie. And the only way we're going to be able to see Green Lantern again is most likely they'll have to reboot it. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know if the Green Lantern is a franchise that, um, I don't know if it's a franchise that people need to see on the screen. You know, Superman, when, when Superman Returns did not make the money that they had hoped, and when 
it failed to produce a sequel, I can certainly understand uh, them saying we need to reboot Superman quickly because it's Superman for goodness sake. You know, you know, <laughs> you're you're you would not expect them to just throw in the towel on Superman. Um, so. The Green Lantern, though, I don't know how eager the world is for another Green Lantern film, um, at least anytime soon. I think it'll probably be a, a long way. Definitely. Now, regarding about the movie, the movie surprisingly actually had a couple of sequels. Uh, one of them was The Summer Story, and the other one was A Christmas Story 2. Now, surprisingly, not a lot of people know about these movies. Uh, can you please give an elaboration on what it is for our listeners? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, My Summer Story was a film um, that was directed by the same director of A Christmas Story, Bob Clark, and written by Gene Shepard and the the same team that worked on A Christmas Story. Um, And it picks up the summer after the Christmas of A Christmas Story. Um, It had an entirely different cast because it was released over a year, I'm sorry, over 10 years, sorry, not over a year, over 10 years after um, a Christmas Story was released. So the only person who reprised their role was Teddy Moore, who played Miss Shields, the school teacher. Um, and the plot of the movie is based around um, Ralphie trying to challenge the school bully um, to a, a spinning top competition. Um, and the movie is actually more entertaining than it sounds <laughs> by that by that brief description. Um, but Charles Grodin plays uh, the old man, the father, and Mary Steenburgen plays the mom. And uh, it's actually a pretty enjoyable film, I have to say. It's a cute film. Um, is it one of my favorite films? No, it's not. But it's, uh, it is a cute film, and it's worth watching um, especially if you are a big fan of A Christmas Story. The uh, the sequel, A Christmas Story 2, is actually uh, what Warner Brothers, who now owns the rights to the movie, calls the official sequel to A Christmas Story. And it takes place many years later, um, when Ralphie is 16, and he is trying to... Um, he goes to try and get a car, and he goes to test drive a car, and he, the car ends up getting damaged, and then he and Schwartz and Flick have to get uh, jobs over the holiday season, department, um, not departmental jobs, uh, seasonal jobs at a department store, to kind of raise money for the damage that he caused to the car. Um, and Daniel Stern plays the old man, and um, that movie is also... Um, Sort of entertaining. You know, I, I like my summer story better, personally, but A Christmas Story 2 is also entertaining. And one of the things that's kind of interesting is that A Christmas Story 2 really uh, harkens back to all the, the jokes and references that you love in A Christmas Story. So you see the leg lamp again. Um, Flick gets his tongue stuck again. Um, not to a flagpole, but it gets stuck in a different way. I won't spoil it. Um, but there are kinds of references... Um, to the weird um, clothing that uh, they get from Aunt Clara as uh, a Christmas gift. So again, all of those kinds of references are back. It's really kind of hard to tell that My Summer Story is a sequel to A Christmas Story. Um, There aren't really direct references. It's really an entirely new story just using those characters. Yeah, um, you know, it would have been interesting if the sequel would have shown first and maybe had all the characters who played in the original movie back as the teenagers, and then my summer story would have been showing them much later. Mm-hmm. No, I agree with you. I mean, I think it's, it is kind of odd timing, and I think that one of the things that happened is, by the time, um, you know, my summer story was released under MGM. So, uh, MGM originally produced a Christmas story and then at some point in time ownership changed and uh, Warner Brothers now owns a Christmas story the film rights were sold to Warner Brothers Uh, so I think the issue is that Gene Shepard and Bob Clark wanted to tell more of Gene Shepard's stories um, and not just repeat what was successful about A Christmas Story. That's why it was an entirely different story. Um, unfortunately, both Gene Clark and Bob... Uh, Gene Clark... 
Gene Shepard and Bob Clark, sorry, um, have passed on. They've since passed on. And um, unfortunately, they weren't involved in A Christmas Story 2. But I think A Christmas Story 2 was kind of Warner Brothers' way of um, having a sequel and kind of um, continuing to get some income from the A Christmas Story franchise. Yeah, because from the sounds of it, you know, with all the references and stuff, I don't know whether they're trying to do an homage to it or they were just trying to be really lazy. Yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> I, don't know either. Um, I think, you know, I I think that um, there are some people that would say it's an homage and there are some people that would say the latter. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to say. Um, I will say that, um, you know, it's a direct-to-DVD sequel and, you know, direct-to-DVD sequels have a certain reputation. You know, if you've seen any of the American Pie sequels after three and before American Reunion, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but um, but I will say that it is an entertaining movie, even if it might have been a little um, not as creative as, as it could have been. Yeah, definitely so. Um, so I have another question regarding about A Christmas Story. Um, recently there was the Christmas Story musical that's on Broadway. Right. Now, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Sure. So, um, there's actually a different adaptation of A Christmas Story that was written for the stage by a person named Philip Grecian. And, um, at some point, and Gene Shepard was actually involved with that particular production back before he had passed away. Um, he did not live to see the completed project of the non-musical adaptation, but he was involved. Um, however, now, um, so many things go to Broadway. You know, Shrek, Spider-Man, um, The Addams Family. I mean, you know, you can go on and on. Oh, um, Spider-Man! <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see it. I didn't see it. I, I, um... I did not see Spider-Man, but I will say um, there's a really uh, interesting looking book that's coming out in November called, uh, I believe it's called Song of Spider-Man, and it's written by the person who wrote the musical, and the book is all about um, the behind the scenes uh, disasters <laughs> that happened um, in the road to getting that musical made, and I have it on my Amazon uh wish list and i will be purchasing it when it comes out because it just sounds um you know i'd love to know i'd love to <laughs> i'd love to know uh what went on but um a christmas story the musical was conceived and it had kind of a long road to broadway but it did play on broadway last year um the music is written by uh, a duo of young composers called uh Pasek and paul and they are it's a beautiful beautiful score i mean it's actually a great musical um I completely recommend that people go to see it. If you are in uh, the Hartford area or the Boston area or in the New York area, because that's where it will be playing this year, um, I suggest so strongly that you go see it. Because, you know, a lot of times these musical adaptations on Broadway have a reputation of being like, you know, something that people do just to cash in and they're not creative and, you know, they're kind of these throwaway pieces of garbage. And A Christmas Story, the musical, in a way that's really surprising, is so, so charming. It's so great to experience it live. And the music is really well done. Um, and it, I, I was really surprised. You know, I went to go see it last year. Actually, I, I want to say just a week or two before Christmas last year. And I didn't know, um, I didn't know what to expect. You know, a lot of people had told me, oh, it's really, really good. And I thought, you know, maybe they were just saying that <laughs> just, just to be nice or something. And uh, I was floored. You know, everyone in that theater just loved it. And uh, it was great to see. It reminded me a lot, actually, of seeing the Pee Wee Herman show on Broadway, um, where, you know, you hoped that it was great to see Paul Rubens in, uh, in 2011. Uh, you hoped that it would be great to see him live. And it was, you know, you didn't totally know what to expect, but once, um, he came out in that suit and the curtain opened up and you got to see the set, you just became a kid again. And it was like that watching a Christmas story. Wow. That must've been a great experience. Yeah, it was really, really wonderful, and, and uh, the person I went with um, equally was, you know, transformed. <laughs> that sounds. Did you did you had the opportunity to interview some of the actors on the play, or the directors, or the crew members? 
I actually, um, I actually didn't in terms of the musical, um, mostly because at the time that I was writing the book, the musical was still ongoing, so they were all really preoccupied, actually. I spoke to some people that were involved with the musical um, in its earlier days, um, but weren't currently working on the Broadway show because it was just a timing nightmare, really, uh, which is so unfortunate. But um, but there's a whole chapter in the book that's dedicated to the musical and um, all the, the ins and outs and ups and downs to getting it produced and uh, ultimately getting it on Broadway. Oh, that's good that you were able to dedicate a musical to it because I got to say that one of my favorite chapters from the the your book of uh, the you know the Inside Pee Wee's Playhouse was about the music uh, the show in twenty um twenty ten and twenty eleven, just the way that the people were so excited about talking about doing the puppetry and the acting and then the audience interactions and everything about it was just so amazing and. It would have been really nice if maybe you would have gotten, um, you know, you know, a similar scenario in which people who loved the movie when they were kids and they were able to go inside to see this uh, musical and, you know, the following. It's like, you know, this, you know, this musical is basically going to stamp the fact that a Christmas story will last forever amongst many people and many generations. Yeah, no, I agree with you completely. And, you know, um, it's funny that you you mentioned that. Um chapter in Inside Pee Wee's Playhouse because that for me was one of the most exciting uh, chapters to research because I spoke with so many people that, you know, Pee Wee's Playhouse was a long time ago and, you know, there was a huge period of time where Paul Rubens wasn't doing anything as Pee Wee Herman and um, it was so great to talk to all of those puppeteers and actors that had that knew the importance of Pee Wee Herman and that had been trying to um, get Paul Rubens to bring the character back and didn't know whether or not people would show up at the show and whether or not people would like the show and whether or not people would accept him in 2010 and 2011. And, uh, you know, in talking to people, it's there's something so different and I think that you, you're kind of suggesting this, um, and I'm glad I'm glad that it read this way in the book because it certainly was my impression in talking to people. But there was something so different about talking to someone about what they were doing, you know, 25 years ago, and what they were doing two months ago, you know. And people were just so excited to talk about the opportunity to work with Pee Wee Herman and how cool that was, you know, and how they grew up watching the show or, you know, became puppeteers because of watching the show and um, then had the opportunity to work with him. And in a way, I felt like, you know, they and I were one and the same because they were fans and they were doing this great Pee Wee Herman, Pee Wee Herman project. And I was a fan and I was working on the book. Um, which I hoped would uh, be a great Pee Wee Herman project. And I, I really felt such a connection to all those people that I spoke to um, in writing the last chapter of that book. Yeah, um, speaking of, you know, going off topic from A Christmas Story for just a second, you, you probably heard the recent announcement that there might be a possible reboot of Pee Wee's Playhouse, and, you know, of course, there's the Judd Apatow movie, of course. Now, if you were to see a reboot of Pee Wee's Playhouse, what would you imagine the reboot of the show would be if it were to resonate with kids like 2011, or I mean, not 2013? Would it be... <laughs> Would it be like Yo Gabba Gabba, or do you think it, or do you think it doesn't need to change too much at all for kids to resonate it with? Well, I'm going to answer that in two ways. Um, I know that you and I are both um, big fans. We're, we're already fans of uh, Matthew Clickstein, and I have been uh, reading his book Slime. It just came in the mail yesterday, and. It is so so good. I don't know if you've picked it up yet. I know that you're. I know that you're going to his his launch um, for the book, but it is so awesome <laughs> to read. It's great, um, and I I just picked it up today. I literally picked it up this morning. I got it in the mail yesterday. I started reading it this morning. I already had work today, so I you know I had a a, a full day, and I'm already a hundred pages in on this book. It is great. Um, and one of the things that keeps coming up in Slimed about the early days of Nickelodeon, for those that, that don't know, for those that didn't listen to your previous episode, um, go back and listen to it. But um, Slimed 
is the story of Nick's early days, Nickelodeon's early days. And um, one of the things that really resonates in reading the book is that there was such a sense that kids came first and, um, you know, you can do anything. You know, you can be a little bit subversive and you can be, you know, a little bit uh, gross or crude or whatever in in television shows. Um, And it was okay. And if parents were offended by it, who cares? Because they're not supposed to like it. Um, And I think Pee Wee's Playhouse was like that. You know, before... um, even before uh, Nickelodeon really became a huge thing, Pee Wee's Playhouse was a show that really was kind of like that. Now, if you turn on to Nickelodeon um, or the Disney Channel, you see a lot of, you know, if you look at iCarly or you look at Hannah Montana or That's So Raven or any of these things, you know, all the stars are wearing so much makeup and the shows are so slickly produced and they're, you know, they, they all have recording contracts and they have concert tours and, you know, they're not just kids being kids. And if Pee Wee's Playhouse were to come back in a form where it was going to be for children, I would love for it to be um, kind of like it was back in the 80s where it encouraged kids to scream and be messy and, you know, be crude. And it made, uh, you know, jokes that maybe would go over the kids' heads and the parents would get. Um, That's what I would love to see. But also, um, you know, what I think would be even better for the Pee Wee Herman character is, um, I don't know if you remember, I think the show was called Muppets Tonight, where it was a a late night show um, starring the Muppets, and they would interview people. Sure. And it was, um, you know, it was, it was more adult. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, you know, super suggestive or anything like that, but it was, you know, for adults or like, um. Alf, you know, Alf had something like this a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would love to see a show where, you know, Pee Wee Herman uh, was the interviewer. And, you know, he had a late night show on Comedy Central or something like that, or on Nick at Night or something like that, and um, was able to have people on and have fun with them, almost something like uh, Jiminy Glick's show. Uh, And, you know, the Puppet Land Band could be the band, you know, Cool Cat, Chicky Baby, and Dirty Dog could be the band, and, you know, really kind of have fun. You know, the the guests could sit on Cherry for the interview, you know, and just kind of have where the Playhouse characters now are... The, where the show is more for the adults that grew up watching Pee Wee's Playhouse, not so much for kids. Um, I think that would be an equally fun thing to see. That's my that's my million dollar idea, and I, I'd be more than happy with anyone stealing that idea. If you know, if you have it, if you have Paul Rubin's ear, please, you know, steal that idea. I won't even I won't even ask for a dime. Just take it and go with it because I think that it's um, I think that it would be really fun to see. Yeah, that's a great idea. In fact, I, I kind of said the same thing almost in Wienerville, in my top 10 Nickelodeon shows that I would love to see remade. I mentioned that if Wienerville ever gets remade, I would love for it to be more for adults, similar to when Mark Wiener used to perform his puppets in the late 70s in comedy clubs. And the way he used to do like a whole bunch of adult jokes, I would love it if that were to be the case. And you know what, if that would be a fantastic idea, because we've seen Pee Wee before with a lot of uh, talk shows and, you know, a lot of um, scenarios in which he would be talking with people or he'd be doing a lot of like a few minute skits and stuff like that, that would um, involve with celebrities or with normal people and they would know what is going on. Uh, it's, I think it's hysterical. Um, yeah, I, I think that would be a really awesome idea if that were to happen. Yeah, and one of the things, too, is, you know, Pee-wee's Big Adventure, which I think is when Pee-wee Herman is at his best, is great because it juxtaposes Pee-wee Herman's character with people in the everyday world. You know, you get to see him interact with, you know, Mickey and Dottie and, you know, um, uh, Simone, you know, and you get to see how that, how that, those situations play out. And I think it would be great um, to have a situation where Pee Wee Herman is, you know, in control of an interview and someone like, you know, Brad Pitt has to go on to Pee Wee Herman's show to try and plug his movie. And, you know, Pee Wee is just being Pee Wee. Or maybe Brad Pitt you know, has to do some sort of crazy, you know, snack time or something like that, you know, where you get to take these A-list celebrities and uh, put them in Pee-wee's world. I just think that would be such a cool thing. 
Yeah, that'd be awesome, I think. That would be awesome. Now, going back to a Christmas story, um, the, the final thing that I want to discuss about, of course, regarding about a Christmas story is two things. One is the the museum that recently opened up, which happens to take place in the same location where the you know the the movie was shot, which was the house in uh, Ohio, I believe. What right? Right. Yep. And the second thing is is that as of this year, A Christmas Story is going to be celebrating its thirtieth anniversary. Yeah. So A Christmas Story is turning thirty this year. Um, it doesn't look a day over. Uh, you know. <laughs> 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 like that. But um, but yeah, Christmas Story is turning 30 this year, and uh, the Christmas Story House is a tourist attraction that is in Cleveland, and they have a bunch of fantastic things that are planned um, for the 30th anniversary um, celebration. You can go onto their website for more information on that. But what's really um, awesome is, you know, that the actors from the movie still stay together and still do these public appearances and um and people just go crazy when they see them because it's so cool to be able to see um especially since they were kids in the movie to be able to see them as adults um and and i think that is such a cool thing that they have the opportunity to go and meet with fans um and celebrate the 30th anniversary of this movie that they were a part of yeah, I know. Especially since, you know, new generations are getting introduced to a Christmas story. Yep, yeah. It's one of those things where, you know, parents are always showing it to their kids. And in fact, um, for those of you that are, are you know, everywhere, <laughs> I'm going to be... I'm going to be, because we're, on, we're online, and I know that you have lots of listeners, so you know people could be anywhere. So it's worth letting you guys know um, some of the places where I will be. I will be in uh, Chicago. On October 19th, I believe it is. My goodness, I'm going to pull this up just to double check myself. I don't want to give the wrong date. But I'm going to be at Quimby's Bookstore actually on October 12th. Sorry, October 12th in Chicago at Quimby's Bookstore. And I will be there with Mr. Ian Petrella, who uh, played Randy, the little brother Randy in the film. Um, the following weekend, I will be at the Midtown Scholar Bookstore in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And I'll be there by myself. Um, the weekend of the 25th through the 27th of October, I will be in Parsippany, New Jersey at the Chiller Theater Convention, where I will be um, tagging along <laughs> with uh, Ian Petrella, Yado Anaya, who played Grover Dill, the toady, uh, uh, Zach Ward, who played Scott Farkas, and uh, Scott Schwartz, who played Flick. They will rate photo op um, that you can participate in to uh, be in a picture with the, the boys of A Christmas Story and you can get your book signed by me. And um, there's, there's a lot of great things that are happening there. And you should go to chillertheater.com for more information on that or uh, my Facebook page for the book, facebook.com slash A Christmas Story book. Um, and uh, the other big, big thing that I'm going to be participating in with the cast that I'm so excited about is the weekend of, uh, actually on September, sorry, December 14th, we will be uh, in the Buffalo, New York area having a huge screening and a Q&A um, with the cast, and uh, even more cast members will be there for that. So if you are in the Buffalo, New York area, definitely uh, look for us on December 14th. Wow, that sounds amazing. And for any of you guys who are in that area and love a Christmas story, pff, geez, I can't imagine who hates it, please go see Cassin and please um, please promo uh, help promote his books and please spread them around. They are this is going to be a wonderful event that you know is definitely you know something that you would cherish forever. And with that, I think think we can conclude this episode of casual chat so right before we do so um is there anything else that you would love to plug or promote right before we go yeah i just want to say thank you to everyone you know i have um the most amazing people on my facebook page um facebook.com slash kasim gains and um it's it's great you know there are people i i'm not a, a world famous author i write books about fun pop culture things that I would love to read. And um, it's been great that uh, people like yourself and other people have enjoyed the books. And um, if you love A Christmas Story, this truly is um, the book to pick up. And uh, it makes for a great gift as well. It's beautiful. It's in hardcover. It's 
filled with pictures. There are over 150 color pictures in the book. Um, so it is truly something that will be treasured um, in, in your house or in the house of a loved one. So uh, pick up one for you and also pick up one for someone that you know that loves a Christmas story. We will certainly do. Now, right before we go, can you please give us a little bit of a hint on what's coming up next for your next book? Yes. Ooh, a little bit of a hint. Let's see. Um, yes. So I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you an exclusive. No one knows this. This is super top secret. But um, but if your listeners have made it to the end of, of uh, this podcast, then they are deserving an exclusive. Um, the next book is. Uh, time to come out in fall of 2015 and it is uh, based on uh, it's a behind the scenes look at the back to the future trilogy wow this is that is going to be awesome yeah it's tentatively called hey mcfly but um the title may change but it's coming out through plume which is um i'm really excited to be working with them it's a new team for me um but plume is also the company that put out Slimed, actually. So if you uh, if you enjoy Slime, then uh, it's something else coming out from uh, this cool publisher. Yes, and when the book comes out, we definitely have to bring you back for that because absolutely, I hope so. Yes, we certainly will. I will put that in my calendar alongside the day that I will buy my uh, sleeve, um, my laceless Nike sneakers. That we will yes. definitely have you on board to discuss about your new book discussing about the Back to the Future trilogy. And I'm I take to ride my hoverboard to the book launch for that one. Sweet. <laughs> All right then. So that concludes this week's episode of Casual Chats. Once again, Cassine, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And once again, if you uh, for this coming um, this coming weekend on September twenty eighth, if you are in the New York area, please visit Cassine's book event, which is going to be taking place at the Solas Restaurant and Bar in New York City. Until then, this has been a great episode of Casual Chats, and we will see you on the next one. So bye bye. <laughs>